What should we do for an intro? That's a good question. I was going to ask you about that. I don't know if we should get a song, some some royalty free music. Oh, I'm just talking about right now how we're what we're like. Welcome to Shonen In Flop, the only place for your flopping shonens. You should definitely do the introduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do it again, or do I need to edit that in? Welcome to Shonen Flop, your place for flopping shonens. Are we just going to change it every week? You're like, welcome to Shonen Flop, hit or miss, that you never miss, huh? I think we should change it every week. <laughs> okay, All Welcome right. to Shonen Flop, your place for Optimus Prime blue balls. <laughs> Alright, that's, that's the one we're yeah. taking, I guess. Alright, so, a little bit of introduction. This is Shonen Flop. Where myself, David, and my lovely co-host Jordan, hello, we'll be talking about manga that ran in Shonen Jump that wasn't able to make it. For those of you who don't know, Shonen Jump is this humongous manga phenomenon in Japan. It's where a lot of the most popular mangas came out, including Naruto, Dragon Ball Z, and One Piece. Everything you care about that was on Toonami came out of it. Exactly. But not everything works out. Not everything gets to run for 10 years and has 600 chapters. Sometimes we have the flops, where maybe they ran for 20 to 60, but they still have their good element. I mean, some, look, sometimes good things just don't make it for whatever reason, and sometimes sometimes comics deserve that's to true, get axed. but we'll see if that's the case with Zitman. <sighs> Zitman. So, for reference, Zitman is set in the near future, where teenage engineer super genius Kashiro Tatara has died leaving behind his twin brother and main character, Konami. Also, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing lots of things. And please, feel free to get into a fight with me on the internet about that. Konami Tatara, asshole. <laughs> yes, okay, thanks. Um, is a <laughs> Konami is a hot-blooded by the book Shonen Protagonist, who dreams of being the hero Jackman. Nami gets a text from his brother, though, telling him to meet him. It turns out his brother didn't die, but rather had his consciousness put into a super suit which, when worn by his brother, turns them into Zetman, Hero of Justice. They then have to save the city from an organization of evildoers who also have super suits, ruled by the mysterious Chairman. You say that like he's a superhero and his name is Chairman. <laughs> Do we ever actually find out what Chairman's real name is? No. <laughs> the comic doesn't go yeah, that far. Because it's only 17 chapters. Yeah. So... I will say the first thing I want to say is that this is the comic of Kaname and his brother Elon Musk yeah, um, pretty much. coming together to form Hugh Jackman. Um, <laughs> wow, okay. No, um, no, but his brother is literally Elon Musk. Yeah. Like, the company is called Steel. It, it's true. Um, that reminds me, though, how in Dr. Stone, they actually had the Elon Musk like Cybertruck show up in one of the panels. Oh, hell yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> Dr. Stone is definitely worth reading. And then, uh, in terms of actual, like, raw information, Zitman uh, started on December 2nd and ended on April 6th, running for 19 issues, producing 17 chapters. It was created by Yusaku Shibata. Let me look at that name to just make sure you, <laughs> yes, spelled, I spelled you it said right it right. On, that, on this podcast. I don't know. <laughs> God. Okay. <laughs> That's surprising. It, it That really is not a long it's run. It's really not. Um, as I've been looking at some of these series, though, so the interesting thing about it is Shonen Jump actually doesn't really get any data for the first eight chapters, so everyone's guaranteed to run for probably about ten, because there's a two-week lag time. And then the problem is, oh. is they also need to round it, because they need to finish two volumes, which is roughly you know seven to eight chapters, so it makes sense that they said, hey, we have to fill up a second book, you know, here, just get to chapter 17. So basically, they axe it as soon as they Pretty can. much. Um, yeah, we'll get into the actual popularity a little bit, but that gives us a good segue of just kind of the flow of the podcast is we'll start by describing the series, kind of what the setting was like, the characters, what it did well, what it didn't so well. What was some of the potential for the series if it had kept going? Glenn, what would we do? How would we save the comic? How it actually did popularity-wise in Shonen Jump, about the author, some miscellaneous thoughts, and then our final verdict, if it was a flop or not. So, Jordan, though, how would you describe Zipman in six words? Oh, man. Or less? Um, I would describe it as... Um, you didn't ask me to do this, so I don't know if this is going to be six words. It's just going to come out the top of my head. Yeah, um, it's, it's fine. 
Uh, I would say it's a very bare bones manga that is trying to be very meta. It's a manga that's sort of, it's like an action manga that's about action manga almost, except, I mean, it's specifically about uh, like tokusatsu kind of Kamen Rider type mm-hmm. TV shows, but it's really just, it's really about yeah. like power fantasy and stuff. But if I was to, if I was to boil it down, it would be just this, a shonen a shonen manga done well but just so bare bones and there's just not much to it yeah that my heart was, was a lot right more than place. six words but your heart was in the right yeah place, which is really it's really the zip man way okay jordan would you like to go into a bit about the character yeah so we got two we got two major characters there is tatara who has resting evil face i call yeah. it um where he just looks like a bad guy he's got he's got like scars all over his face and he's just like he looks like um he looks like the coach or no he looks like the captain from uh, I Shield Twenty One. Speaking that's what of I other good makers, actually that's why they gave me Doctor Stone. So maybe that's yeah. just a theme. Yeah, yeah, same writer. Really, I didn't know that. That's why uh, the I Shield Twenty One guy cameos in it because there's a little, little joke. By the I author. Shield Twenty One's great. Um, oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, so that Kaname, I I actually really like Kaname as a character. He's um absolutely means well and he's actually very competent but he just has no he, <laughs> he worships his older brother Co- his younger brother well they're twins i don't think they ever say who was born first. they're twins who gives a shit um that's another problem this manga is kind of unmemorable um and whereas koshiro who i mentioned earlier is basically elon musk he's this young super genius and the the, the kind of the way that this manga wants you to look at it is that kaname is like this yeah incredibly powerful physical force like he is super strong he's um he's always helping people he is like literally he doesn't belong to one school club because he belongs to all of them because like the baseball team will go out and be like hey kaname we need somebody who's really strong and he'll just do it yeah they're like he just hits like a home run every yeah. time so Kaname is the physical powerhouse, whereas Koshiro is obviously the mental powerhouse. He's just this super genius to an absurd <laughs> level. Like, imagine if Elon Musk actually did the things he said he was going to do, and you have Koshiro. But he's also a fucking asshole. Yeah, I was actually going to say, in one of my notes on the characters, he's just like a humongous prick. And actually, like, the author is so dedicated to making him seem like an asshole, he acts, like, yeah. out of character in a way to be a huge asshole like just to skip there is a scene where after they beat the first guy his brother's yeah. just like okay you can leave and they're like we know there's more bad guys you even say the suit doesn't work without both yeah Why are there you are him a out? lot of no things sense. with uh coach 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 I'm, I'm fucking up now <laughs> elon, elon musk. there are a lot of things with elon musk's uh character that just kind of i don't i don't like the motherfucker um and yeah Part of it is just, but there is, there is kind of an interesting thing though, where one of the incredibly underdeveloped people in the character, in the comic, who is Kochiro's assistant, who's just this hot lady who smokes cigarettes, is just like, oh, oh, you're always talking about your brother, with the implication that <laughs> like, actually when Kaname isn't there, Kochiro is actually way more positive towards his brother. I thought that was like a little interesting detail, but it just isn't built on. Mm-hmm. So one, I mean, that's the name of the game with this. One thing is, does she have a name? I re, I've reread it three times, and I cannot for life remember. I what think her they name was. say it once. They say the assistant guy who always wears a mask yeah. name, but I just, I never saw him say her uh, name. So we also have to get to the third character, who is like Gina. Gina. I mean, she's a damsel in distress for most of the, for a lot of the manga. Yeah. she's she's definitely kind of like a manic pixie dream girl. Konami sort of blames her for why he and Kochiro hate each other. Mm -hmm. Like, they were both really close together, and then um, Chena showed up, and they suddenly started uh, kind of vying for her affection, or trying to make her smile, is how they describe it. Yeah, you gotta protect that smile, my guy. (laughs) It's like, I mean, it's manga, but come on. (laughs) She, but But the issue there is that it just, it doesn't really get deeper than that. One of the biggest examples of what I think the writer has an issue with. I'm sorry, this isn't necessarily the uh, structure of the correct structure of the 
of the podcast. Hey, we can change it up. Do you want to start with talking about what it didn't do well? Because, uh, spoiler alert, viewers, it did not do a lot well. Yeah, sure. Um, One of the parts that I think is most exemplary of everything it does wrong is um, there's a specific part kind of early on where it actually has um, uh, Kaname and Kochiro are getting their asses kicked by a bully. We don't know how. <laughs> Why is it yeah. happening? Because it's a shonen trope. A lot of things in this happen because they're shonen tropes. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to say is that really, it it feels like it really wants to deviate from the shonen tropes because you see hints of it. Like in the second fight, one thing I noted that was really interesting is he develops a new super move, but the super move fails. And he had to be intelligent about a weird property. What's the second fight? Oh, you mean against uh, Sailor Moon? So the Sailor Moon, yeah. And then for context, everyone is like supposed to be like a parody of different like stereotypical. Like he he fights the Monkey King, he fights Sailor Moon. But one thing that was interesting, he does not fight Optimus Prime. He does Prime. not. Um, we will get into Optimus Prime in a minute. But so something that's interesting is he develops a super move where he can make a giant fist. And one of the powers of super that Zipman can do is after he defeats someone, he's kind of able to Mega Man, and that if he beats someone, he gets their powers. This kind of is just Mega Man, honestly. Yeah. Um, TV Trumps actually calls it Mega Manning. <laughs> like, like, I feel like if this was the plot of a game, I would have, like, no problem with it. But it's not. Oh, yeah. It's not. It would be a really interesting, like, DMCA-style game. One thing is just, so he makes his fist giant, and the opponent actually, like, blows a hole in the fist. And he's like, ah, I'm still too strong for you, Zip Man. But it turns out he's using the giant fist to actually hide himself. And that lets him get really close to his opponent and beat him. Yeah. Which I thought was actually quite intelligent. But then that level of like intelligence and showing how you have Elon Musk teaming up yeah. with, um, I don't know what the nickname for the R main character. Um... Fucking uh, Danny Trejo. Um, <laughs> you have Elon Musk working with Danny Trejo. Oh, God. But... I was going to say Jean-Claude Van Damme or something. <laughs> Well, Danny Trejo's got, like, all the scars and stuff on You know his what? Face. Yeah, let's just go with... Da let's just call him Danny Trejo, whatever. Okay, so you got Danny and Elon working together. But after that fight, the manga says, that was too much effort. We're just gonna have people just fight really hard and not try and be clever about how these moves actually could potentially work. You know what I felt about... What I feel about it, um, mm -hmm. with how you're talking about how it's, like, deviating from... Yeah. It's trying to deviate from shonen tropes. The way that it's trying to do this is by condensing things. So it's mm -hmm. like, look, I'm not going to sit here and explain to you how this mechanic works. You're reading a shonen manga. You get mm -hmm. it. But the problem yeah. with that is that you lose out on the world building that goes along with explaining that. You you lose the depth that would be there. And the the author doesn't replace it with anything. There isn't, like... Mm -hmm. like the, he constantly does this. There's another part where... Like, he constantly just takes out complexity in order to make things simple, like, simpler. Um, yeah. There's one moment where, um, and I think the second, or maybe even, like, the first fight. Yeah, I think it's the first fight against Sailor Moon, where, um, well, that's that second, whatever. Um, Kochiro says, like, ah, I left your, your team and stuff like, and, like, I was with you guys and I just left. And... Or, or I betrayed you because you guys uh, lost your ideals. And later he's talking to Kaname and Kaname's like, so did you really know them? And Kochi was like, nah, I was just making it up. And I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. You just, what you did is you just set up a situation where Kochiro could have ex additional depth and like a connection to mm -hmm. like, like a further story. And then he just took it away. Or there's, yeah. a, there's another part that's very similar to that that happens shortly after that where they say, um, Kochiro, like, uh, where they say that um, they're trying to put Kochiro back in his body because Kochiro, I don't think we mentioned, has been put in the Jackman suit. Um, yeah. So they're like, we're going to put you back in your body. But the manga starts off with Kochiro's funeral. So mm -hmm. Kaname is like, well, we burned your body. And Kochiro says, no, that was a dummy. Why? <laughs> That it would be it would be more interesting if they had burned his body and that was another aspect that they had to fill. And then here's the here's the crazy thing, spoilers, he never gets back into his real body. That's true, he doesn't. So it really didn't matter. But the author is trying to solve problems that he himself brought and, up. And another thing, by the way, in terms of that speech with the second villain, uh for context, the first villain is literally like a giant robot that he punches really hard and dies. Like it doesn't even have like a personality. The second villain is the first villain that actually talks. 
And so what's interesting is he's like, oh, we're actually the good guys. You know, you guys yeah. are on the path of justice. And then he immediately calls his own organization greedy. We are going to unleash our greed to tear down society. How can you possibly think you are the protagonist in this story and then say a line like that? No, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's... um. That was an aspect that I kind of thought was interesting. And like, honestly, there is sort of a justification at the end when the chairman just completely brainwashes Kaname, where it's like, he convinces yeah. him to like, that like, oh, in order to save China, I must kill China. So that's sort of, I guess, but again, that's me justifying it for the comic. The comic makes no attempt to like, connect the, those things. No, and it just, it didn't care. I mean, look, every single character overall, there is nothing special about the plot and dialogue are stilted. It really felt like it kind of had NPC syndrome, where everyone just exists for the purpose of moving the plot forward. Yeah. There was no depth. There was no personality. There is nothing that, personality-wise, we learn about any of these characters that are not directly tied into advancing the plot in some capacity. I actually, I think Kaname becomes kind of an interesting character at certain mm -hmm. points. I think he does. Like, the 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 part where he... um. Like, one, my favorite chapter is actually, there's a part where, I don't even remember why they have to do this. I just read it. I don't know why they had to do this. I didn't care. Yeah. They had to, um, they had to, like, um, talk to this girl and, like, find out how she knew this phantom yes. cosplayer. It's actually totally out of place because it goes from being, like, this action <laughs> manga to taking place in a high school. And it's kind of like, we have to examine, like, uh, the awkwardness of Kaname, mm -hmm. which actually winds up being, I I think you agree, one of the most interesting parts yeah, of the Yeah, I was manga. actually going to talk about that, and I'll expand it more, is I think that yeah. there's a really interesting element. Because you literally have a case where he has an earpiece with his brother helping him how to interact with people. And so you have to deal with Kaname being the socially awkward guy, but having to socialize because his brother is literally a soul trapped in a robot suit. Yeah. But, like, at the same time, if you actually read it, Kaname kind of does it without taking his brother's advice. Like, he takes his brother's advice, but he winds up doing it just by doing the same things he was doing overall. Yeah. Which, like, I think actually kind of made it interesting. The The basic premise behind Kaname, along with being this, like, mm -hmm. super fiery guy, is that he's obsessed with this comic, this uh, TV show called uh, Jackman. Like, and he's just yeah. obsessed with, like, the Cayman Rider kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so this girl is just eating food that, like, did a promotion with Jackman. And yeah. Because this whole time, it's it's a really interesting kind of part because it's it's Koshiro telling Kaname you have to be empathetic, and Kaname is consistently the most blatantly empathetic character in the whole manga. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he connects he connects with it with like like uh, that's from your favorite idol group. They did a song from Jackman <laughs> that I like. <laughs> yeah. It's cute. He's adorable. I actually, I really like Kaname. He's definitely the best part After of the manga. Optimus Prime. Well, Optimus Prime is is not a part of the manga, David. That's, true. That's a problem. But yeah, I think ties into another thing. It's just every single other character is so two dimensional. And one thing I've realized as a series is I kind of feel it's like a boss rush because essentially they are taking absolutely completely unmodified the Dragon Ball Z method of where you just fight harder and harder opponents, and then you kind of have like a break. And then it, the cycle yeah. begins again. Yeah. yeah. And the designs look cool. I think the zipper aesthetic is cool. The chairman mm -hmm. looks awesome. What they what he did with the chairman, so like the basic idea with um all of the enemies is they all have kind of this zipper aesthetic where they have like, you know, the zipper teeth going around them. But for the chairman, they swap the zipper teeth for actual like sharp like animal teeth. Yeah. And it's like it's really creepy. Kind of eldritch in a way. Um Yeah, no, it's great, especially because he's like the last guy. But the thing is, it's also my issue with the aesthetic is how could how the fuck were you going to extend this aesthetic to like 200 chapters? Could you imagine reading chapter 200 of Zipman and we're still facing enemies that are made out of zippers? Ah, uh, that's true. Like that would get so boring. I was starting to get sick of it towards the end of the manga. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Oh, look, another guy who has zippers." It's teeth. just such a specific gimmick. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's like he drew like a really cool piece of art. He's like, let's make a series out of it. Yeah. Because he just loves that zipper, like, split face aesthetic. Yeah. And he does it well. Yeah. But it's like, you need more. And I think that's kind of <laughs> the biggest problem. You you either, I think with this manga, you it either needs to be wackier or more, or less wacky. 
it's not in a good space. Yeah. And I think you can tell that he wanted it to last for a long time, but he didn't know how, because there's just so much artificial padding. And one of the ways he does this is he uses a trope I really hate, which is kind of the, like, no time to explain, where characters <laughs> will ask questions and then just conveniently, oh, I just, I can't go into detail right now. I'll explain this <laughs> later. Or, like, ah, oh, let me explain things. And then one of the characters just literally dies as soon as he's about to explain something. And you know it was just he didn't know what the explanation was, so he needed to give himself more time. And then they just never really are like, okay, well, we just defeat the bad guy. We have time now. Why don't you explain what you were going to explain? And no, they just don't ask again. It just doesn't get explained unless the plot needs them to know what exactly is going on. Oh, yeah. No, the most blatant example of that, though, there's a character named um, Mr. D who looks like he looks like Shade Man from Mega Man, except a dragon. Uh Uh-huh. Um... And the thing about him is he's like, I, f- I know his weakness. I will defeat him. Let me go off and fight him. The next panel, Jackman just shows up and he's like, and he's, and he has Mr. D's weapon. And he's like, yeah, I killed him. And even the bat, even the bad guy he's facing is like, you already killed Mr. D? You really did? Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. He was talking big shit. I thought he was going to be longer. I thought that was going to take him more time. <laughs> yeah. Which would have been fine, but the series just does not earn a moment like that. No, it, it, it's just so blatantly rushed. It's almost like a self-aware moment, and not in a good way. <laughs> One thing um, that's interesting is all this rushing stuff is happening around chapter 10. Yeah, it's around did. the time where he would really be like, all right, we're not doing so great. I should probably try and either do something to make it more interesting or wrap it up. And so he kind of realizes he's just going to have to wrap it up because he never broke the top 10. Um, So he knew he was not going to get 200 chapters out of the story. No, I mean, the thing is, I think that if this manga had maybe 10 more chapters, maybe it would be better. But it's like, I, there's no, this doesn't go to 50 chapters. I think it could have gone to 50 chapters. Because one thing as well is that there is no world building. We don't know exactly how this world exists. Like there's all this super technology And nothing builds upon it until literally, like, there's, like, there's three pages at the end of the last chapter that show, like, how the zipper technology has improved the world. And they're like, why didn't you ever show that before? That's just interesting. Why are you hoarding this technology that would make the world so much more different? Because right now, our world is the same, except we have drone delivery. That actually works. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, no, wow, absolutely. what a difference. It's, um, it's true. The, uh, the artist, like, the fact that he is primarily the artist for My Hero Academia, right? Assistant artist assist. for My Hero Academia. That makes so much sense yeah. because what he is, he's an extremely efficient mm-hmm. art author and artist. Which, you know, as mentioned earlier, it's a double-edged sword because everything is devoted towards just moving the plot forward and not on the characters or the world at all. It's mm-hmm. it's like um like the bully that I started talking about this earlier. I feel like it's so exemplary of what happened because the way that he draws the bully mm-hmm is he's just this big, meaty dude, (laughs) but he's got, like, a little kid face. And what it does is it shows you right away, I know what that bully is, I know that he is strong, and I understand the dynamic. But the problem is that by doing that, you don't take any time to be like, well, who is the bully? Who's this bully? He's not not a bully. He's, like, the bully. That's his whole character. You're not supposed to see a person there. You're supposed to see a representation of... Yeah, a really good example of this is also the fact that their parents just don't matter. His mother is mentioned once, but they're like, you never yeah. see him like fighting the guilt of knowing his brother is alive. His his fit, his brother literally died what a week ago. Like they don't show his family being destroyed yeah. by having their son die, or just I think that would have been a really interesting element to be like, I know that my brother is alive. I have all of this kind of like morale I can bring to my family, but no, I have to hide it just you know for the. For the generic, ah, oh, I've got to keep this secret from my family. There's a difference between being having superpowers and being like, oh, hey, uh, your son that's is still true. alive, by the way. But see, that's the thing, is her mom doesn't matter to the plot, yeah, so she doesn't that's a reasons. very good point. That didn't occur to me. Yeah, tell your fucking, tell your fucking mom that her son's alive. How about that? Um, which, again, My Hero Academia, one of my favorite characters is uh, Deku's mom. <laughs> Oh, also reminds me how the yeah. super form, the zip form quad literally comes out of nowhere. There is absolutely no setup or explanation. Oh, or for how that. about the fact that after the time skip, there's a time skip, by the way. Um, yeah, there after, is. After the time skip, there is a thing where the zipper, like the zipper chairman, 
the evil zipper chairman sends down like these giant things that like um they're they're basically giant zipper suits that like absorb people and make them become part of them yeah. in other words literally the thing that happens in kill a kill it li- <laughs> exactly except instead of the broad thing of clothing it's just zippers yes which is you know the most important part that's of fair yeah <laughs> so yeah uh i'm down with going to high points now all right so i think the first thing i would like to discuss in terms of positive is probably the art oh, the art yeah the art very well done completely competent but there are a few little nitpicks the first one is mm-hmm. there's no background which is like the bleach playbook That's true. of backgrounds only exist that they <laughs> need to be there which I understand yeah. there's time crunches, but still it's a little frustrating to see white or like gray shade behind everyone. Yeah. The second is the characters seem really rigid. Like everyone always stays on model, but not necessarily always in a good way. Like it's a drawn comic, but it feels like to be honest, he made 3D models and he's posing them rather than actually drawing things from yeah. scratch. Which might be what happened. Yeah, um, that's true. That's not a su- that's not a super uncommon thing right now. And then uh, finally, there's just a bad sense of flow in the panels. Like in the first issue when he does the rocket fist, you don't even know he shot off a rocket, like his hand is a rocket, until you like notice the guy being punched. Like there's just, it was like a, an elapse in panels. Like he really was missing one or two panels to show the actual action and impact of it. And it was just by me understanding the tropes, knowing that's what he did. I thought we were talking about the positives right now, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you're right. <laughs> um, no, but one thing that I really liked was, um, I just like Kaname. Like, when he's talk, there's a there's a <laughs> point where he's, where he's talking to, um, so the Sailor Moon, yeah. the, the, the Sailor Moon, um, showdown, which might be the best one, partly because you could tell the author wasn't aware that he had to wrap the whole thing up yet. Yeah. Um, so it kind of takes its time. It's like a full encounter, mm-hmm. where he encounters this this like mech suit that's shaped like sailor moon or cutie charm as they call it here and mm-hmm. kaname after they defeat it it turns out that the person inside of cutie charm is a boy and mm-hmm. he's like oh i don't want anybody to know that uh oh nobody would like me if they knew that i was actually like a guy inside cutie charm mm-hmm. and kaname is like no i like a guy cutie guy cuties are cool but cutie would never attack her friend so you're a bad cutie so you must and he explicitly tells him rewatch all of cutie again <laughs> i dem- <laughs> like he- he's like it's great it's like um if somebody who likes superman did a bad thing it's like you motherfucker go back and watch superman again i uh, so uh is it mirror did the cutie robot kind of look like meta be for metabots yeah i okay. yeah okay. i saw that note and i get it i yeah. totally see it it's uh absolutely well yeah if that second fight was the quality standard for the series it might have lasted to be honest so it still wasn't it would, that fantastic like i still dropped yeah. around chapter seven and eight the first time it wasn't fantastic but it was a good it was good for where it was and i you know you get stuff yeah. out of it it was a good it was a good um, encounter let's see what else Oh, by the way, as for the the panel continuity, there is one, sp- like, and the flow that you're talking about, there's one part where um, the third encounter is with this lady who has a giant sword, and her whole thing is that she has a 3D yeah. printer attached to her arm that that just rapidly creates yep. giant swords. Or a morning star. Um, but, yeah, or a morning star. So... Kaname or Jackman gets this uh, Zipman. I'm sorry. Yeah, so for context, he starts as Jackman. Um, And literally, the character's like, hey, that could be copyright infringement. So we need to change our name. Literally, yeah. It's it's pretty good. It's it's pretty funny. Um, He changes his name to Zipman um, in just this very, just this very um, ham fisted metaphor where they show the panels zipping up. And it's like, I get it, man. I get the metaphor. But. So, um, uh, oh yeah, so he gets, um, this ability to 3D print weapons, and out of nowhere, this, he just starts throwing lances, and there's, like, very little to tell you. They don't explain that. You have to look at a previous panel that just shows him reaching into his arm and pulling something out, and it's a small panel. Yeah, like, the fact that he Mega Man's... Again, the second fight really shows it, and then they're just like, all right, clearly we showed you this one time that he could do it in this one particular instance, but yeah. clearly now he can always do it. And, yeah, 
They can make a man. Um, which I would be fine if they took the time to explain each individual power. Like, if they were like, mm-hmm. oh, by the way, like, you have to show him learning that, oh, wow, I can throw if They had, like, lances. a power acquire, like, some sort of generic thing, which a lot of mangas, like, show as, like, a joke, but if they had actually just yeah. done it straight, it, it would have helped a lot understand exactly how it works. Man, solo leveling is just so much better than this. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of what else does it do well? Uh, I actually thought they were clever in that he knew he had to wrap things up. And so rather than skipping a bunch of content, he actually creates the secondary characters that actually have purpose yeah. in that they do off it. Like when there's the four bad guys, Zipman takes care of one guy and then the three other bad guys are just dealt by the side characters. They naturally, they don't show anything about it. Like, we don't even know what the three other bad guys really look like besides their silhouettes. Yeah. But at least they gave the other characters something to do. Yeah. No, I think that uh, there are many worse ways to wrap it up than he did, honestly. Like, yeah. Um, and I think there... Is it a two-year time skip? I actually don't remember um, how long it was. Yeah. But yeah. So he he's just like, fuck it. All right. Clearly, we've got to end this. So he spends like the last six chapters just ending everything yeah and um yeah pretty much it's uh like all of a sudden there's like like a wukong guy like you know like goku Mm -hmm. from journey to the west the monkey king he's a monkey there he's a robot guy and he's got a power pole like from dragon ball Mm -hmm. and uh finally zip man meets his match at that point because up until then he's kind of just been mowing through everything yeah he just like literally like one hits every single person including yeah, like, literally the guy who said, oh, I know your weakness got one. It was probably the fastest fight as the dude who explicitly was supposed to be, like, the- his counter. That was insane. <laughs> we are doing a terrible job of talking about the positives. It's weird, because I enjoyed it. I, I didn't, like, the first time I read it, I, I enjoyed it. Like, because I guess, I guess the best thing I can say about it is it's a very easy read. It, it, it it's, it's a very fast read. You're, which is, you know, part of the problem. But it's a very fast read, and you can just... You can zip zip through it. <laughs> wow. That wasn't even intentional. <sighs> wow. Um yeah. And then um I don't think we've actually really gone into the Optimus Prime situation. This is mm-hmm. the biggest issue with this comic in my opinion. Yeah, there are two instances in which they do the by the book everyone does this. We'll show the bad guy still away. Except What's the weird thing about the silhouette? <laughs> One of them's Optimus Prime. Yes. So that's the thing is, it wasn't like it was a joke. They, he legitimately was like, yeah, we're going to make Optimus Prime a bad guy in this comic. There, This happens twice. They show him again. Like, yeah. He never shows up. Yeah. The other people show up. He doesn't. It's, I have Optimus Prime blue balls. I'm very angry about this. You promised me Optimus Prime. Yeah. You could have had it. You could have had it as a joke in one panel, and then not had him actually fully appear. Yeah, that's the, the thing. If it panel. was just one panel, I'd yeah. be like, whatever. <laughs> when you have two, and one of them is a pretty big panel too, where you just you see him like pretty explicitly. There's no hiding it. I'm not quite sure how he wasn't going to get. Sick. Um, and I was kind of wondering. Well, maybe is one of the bad guys like? You can kind of argue <laughs> that it was Optimus Prime, but no, you can't. They just look totally different. It's no, yeah, he lied. Yeah, this is um, Rotimus Brian, his his uh, freestyling cousin. That's fair. Um, well, I mean, the same way that he got away with Sailor Moon, he just makes something that looks almost exactly like Optimus Prime and has its like has Optimus's uh, you know silhouette or whatever. Rotimus Brian. Oh, that reminds me. Um. One of the first bad guy, the first main bad guy before the time skip pulls out the Autobot Matrix of Leadership. Oh, yeah. That's a soul stealing device. Yeah. <laughs> just, he just. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> no, I mean, was that supposed to be. Was the Optimus Prime supposed to represent that guy? Because I don't think he was. No, no, because that dude shows up in the same, like, room as yeah. the second time Optimus Prime shows up. So I, I just, I think, because like I said, remember there was going to be four main, like, disciples of the chairman, and we only see one of them, and then I think he was going to be one of the other three. So he was one of the bad guys that was dealt with off screen. I just don't remember any of that, because it was just, like, so, so useless to me. Like, 
Like, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the central problem with this manga. I just, I just don't care. Yeah. There's just no reason to care. No, oh, I mean... <laughs> shit, I mean, uh, you want to move on to the next segment? Sure. All right, so here's actually what I think might be my favorite part yeah. of this. is Let's talk about what could have happened. Yeah. And really what could have made it, what could have salvaged the series. And I think one of the big things is, I think it would have been an interesting twist if they had made Chino like uh, Koshiro more than Konami. Mm. So he has to inherently fight his urge to bring his brother back. Because now he's saying, am I going to sacrifice this potential romance with this girl I've always had a crush on, even though I know she has substantially more feelings for him? Huh. You know, and it just would have added a tinge of selfishness to, is it really, should I really get my brother to get his human body back? Yeah, and one of the, well, one of the more interesting parts about the manga is that uh, Kochiro views, feels the complete opposite way, I think, mm -hmm. where it's like, where it actually turns out that, like, actually, is the one who always makes Chino smile. Like, he's kind of the mm -hmm. catalyst for all of Kochiro's views but kochiro doesn't give him any of his credit because he's a dirty fucking capitalist pig god because we live in a society fucking society david <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be getting into that manga soon Ugh. okay yeah um dear listeners yeah find out real soon about pretty much if if an alt writer wrote a manga and showed a jump yeah if an alt writer did that if right but um yeah I mean that's that's a good way. Of, that's a that's kind of interesting. Um, you're putting more like of a character dynamic in there. I, I was kind of thinking about it more just in terms of making the aesthetic last mm. longer. Well, first of all, I think that there should definitely be some issue with returning Kojiro to his body. Yeah, like you said, they should have destroyed his body. Yeah, what I think this series kind of needs to do is it needs to get out of the zipper territory. I, I think, like... So I'm a fan of these things called crazy genre shifts. I've told David about them before. It's like my it's like my favorite stupid thing that manga yeah. does that I actually really love, where mm -hmm. you can tell halfway through certain mangas that the author is just like, shit, this isn't going anywhere, and then he just completely changes gears. Yu-Gi-Oh! did it. That's probably the most famous example. Mm -hmm. um, Yu Yu Hakusho, actually, is, the most, is one of the most blatant ones. Yeah. The author says that no, I no, I planned that the whole time, and I call total bullshit on that. No, you didn't. <laughs> but no, I was thinking this wouldn't even be that crazy. Um, what he needs to do, I think he should go into space and fight other like uh, other teams that are like based on certain like certain aesthetics or something. Just something to vary the zipper shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I really think if they had really taken on the League of Buttons, <laughs> the League of the oh, the. Man. Uh, the Velcro Squad? Yes. Or, um... <laughs> the Ziploc Saga really would have hit something different. Yeah. yeah. No, I think the Ziploc guy is, like, um... He's a renegade. He's, like, the rogue, uh... He he's, like, a, a ronin. You know, Ziploc actually sounds like a badass name for, like, a shonen villain if you didn't know what a Ziploc was. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Especially in this manga. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yes. I actually 100% Say, if this had kept going, there would have eventually been a villain named Ziploc. There definitely should have been. <laughs> it's yeah. time God. for the Ziploc. So they just come kidnap people and put them in the bags. You're like, we're staying fresh. It's just like a wrestling move. He's got them in the Ziploc! <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, in terms of other things, though, I think they really should have played up the Konami socially awkward element. Like, that whole... In yeah. terms of crazy genre, what if it really became, like, the focus of it was him having to act like a normal person for intel and stuff? Because that, that story element really did need to exist. You know what? I agree. Yeah, what if this, uh, what if he went to high school? Fuck it. What if he went to, like, a high school of other fucking robots? I don't know. I mean, it's, this is the assistant yeah. for My Hero Academia, so you <laughs> yeah, can probably true. pull it off. Yeah, well, <laughs> what if, like, he's trying to, like, get this girl to fall in love with him? It shifts into a slice of life where he has to impress this girl, and at night he's trying to solve his brother's mystery while fighting villains. Oh my god, wait a minute. That's, that's yeah. kind of it. That's, like, kind of the best way to do this, where it's mostly, where it's mostly a slice of life comic, but then... It all, yeah. He's also doing Jackman on the side, but it focuses mm -hmm. on the slice of life. I think that is actually probably the best way to do that, because that was just so much more interesting than the Jackman shit. 
Oh, and they could have the logo could have been like a heart with a zipper that's like split part of the way. So there's like a instead of like the normal break. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Oh man, we should we should sell this one. Yeah, it's jump. called Ziploc. Yeah. <laughs> God. God, Ziploc. It's just such an intimidating name for such a, for a fucking household product. If you, if you just have no clue what a Ziploc, you call yourself a warlock. Well, I'm a Ziploc. <laughs> Shut your trap. <laughs> oh, oh man, yeah. You get it. It's just all the villains are based on containers. You got <laughs> you got like a military guy, the jarheads, and then uh, bear, you got bear trap. Oh, someone who is like now the Tupperware like team, <laughs> a tra- <laughs> trash can villain. We're approaching One Piece level of uh, gang design, which is good. Oh, actually, you know he was also an assistant with Oda. That makes sense. And he worked on One Piece, but clearly he had no influence because he didn't take any lessons. Well, one of the most, one of the best parts about One Piece's art is the backgrounds. Yeah. Because the art, the actual art of the characters is very loose, but the backgrounds are always just so dr- so well defined and like structurally like solid. So yeah, absolutely. He uh, wish he learned that. I think One Piece always has backgrounds. Um, doesn't it? Pretty much. I mean, uh, I remember I read the Arlong saga like not too long ago, and I was just like shocked at the way he was so good at just drawing architecture because you look at the characters and you think, Oh, this guy is like, yeah. like not that technically proficient. You know, he, he like Luffy does not look like he was drawn by like a master draftsman, but like, I mean, he is Oda's really good and his, assi- his assistants are helpful. I, it would be interesting to see what this guy's contributions were to one piece. There were two other yeah. things I want to talk about. It's like the Mega Man powers, definitely actually was a really cool element and it would have been interesting to see him not only gain these powers learn how they work their quirks yeah. but also how they work together like he hints at it where he uses the dragon wings on a fist which again is not a the combination power is again not something that's ever yeah. really discussed or at one point they just do the transformation to the second level they're like quad fusion which i think yeah. is so- supposed to imply that he combined all of the uh all of like the zippers that he got that had their powers like he combined all yeah. the powers he yeah. got but it's like mm-hmm. it really was out of nowhere and i didn't know what the fuck he was talking about <laughs> exactly especially because he did the fusion after his brother still had left the suit yeah but uh the last thing is something interesting was how everyone seemed to be inspired by media like the second villain is based on tv show he's inspired by zip yeah. or jackman and I think that would have been interesting to show the media's influence of just how this is taking people where people actually have the agency to become heroes and inspiring them to become these superheroes they're watching shows about. And that's not really ever touched on besides just kind of implied. And I think that would have been a cool element too, to be like, oh, there's this generation of people that are trying to do good or do evil because they're inspired by the media. You know, literally society is is self-fulfilling its desire for people to want to be superheroes. It's true, and honestly, like, that was the part that I found, that was, like, the aspect of the plot that I think was the most ripe to be, like, uh, expanded upon, because that sort of is the core. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at its base, what this manga is, is it's about people who grew up with these, uh, images of heroism and these images of what's cool, Mm -hmm. and now they're trying to become, like, they're trying to ascend to what that view of what's cool Mm -hmm. um but the only way for them to do it is to just artificially create it in a way that actually does the opposite of what they're trying to do because all these people refer to themselves as heroes but their method of being heroes involves them putting everybody in danger they directly say that it's role play like they're playing a game with these people but they view these people as like you know, lesser thus lesser than them as just tools exactly. for their own power fantasies. Um, All right. And then the next section I'd like to talk about is, because you didn't have anything else you'd like to discuss, dude, is just the popularity. Not at the moment. So Zipman ultimately never was popular. It's best is it was 10th place twice, I believe, Woof. which is out of Woof. 15. And so, Ooh. yeah. So essentially, he, the first eight chapters are never... Uh, popularized so there's an eight week lag so he came in being like all right new series where do we do 10th place ah fuck i'm gonna get canceled and yeah he just he really just bounced between 10th and 15th place which is i believe last place for his entire run so he knew he was on the chopping block probably as soon as he got the first 
results back in terms of popularity. Yeah. Um, do you know the specific... Do, can you speculate on the specific chapter where you think he realized this wasn't going to work? Yeah, so that's what I was saying before, is I believe chapter 10, which is really when he starts like one hit killing everyone and he just speeds everything up, that, because there's a two-week lag time, so what I believe would have happened is he was working on chapter 10 when he finally gets his results back for the first eight chapters, and then he's like, mm-hmm. all right, I'm going to get canceled, so I need to wrap this up. So he, yeah. that's, you'll notice that the speed of it really speeds up around that point. Um, and it's, but yeah, so overall, he probably knew the last seven chapters were the last seven chapters. And that really says a lot about how the series is. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you can, uh, you can tell because like, there's just so many points where yep. I can tell the author just like, we gotta go, we gotta yeah. go, we don't have time. No, let's hurry up, go, run. Um, Oh man, I wrote like some specific things. Uh oh yeah, the part where um so they face off against this weird cat lady yeah. who makes giant monsters out of people and the whole thing is like, "Oh, I mean, it's that typical thing you've seen a bunch of times where it's like, "Oh man, if you fight if you punch the bad guy, you're actually going to hurt the good people that I sewed into it." Yeah, no, there's a part where um they're fighting this weird cat lady and Zipman says or one of them says, uh, that zipper isn't even worth taking, which I read as, <laughs> yeah, we don't have time exactly. to deal with this power. Um, all right. And then in terms of last things, let's see. So about the author himself, uh, Yasuku Shibata. So he was an assistant on both One Piece and My Hero Academia, mm-hmm. which is not a surprise on the later note, because he literally pretty much takes the art style. And he actually created a pilot called Zippo, which as far as I oh, can yeah. tell was never translated. And essentially it's kind of like a proto pilot for Zipman. It looks pretty cool, but since it's not translated, it's hard to really know what is going on in it. But it's got pretty much the same mechanics of people mm. in su- suits that zip up. I mean, I don't have problems with how this guy draws draws art. I mean, like, if the, if the writing was better, even the criticisms I have of his art probably wouldn't even be that big of a deal. There's a lot of art I read. There's a lot of manga I've read where the art is way worse, but it's just yeah. more compelling. Mm-hmm. You know? Like... Yeah. I also want to say that in terms of just miscellaneous spots, I think Chef's Kiss on the translation of how, as the first name they think of is naming themselves Flyman, which I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and think that was on purpose to be really clever about the whole zipper fly thing. So I'm going to say that if that was on purpose, I salute to you, translator, because that is fantastic. Um, So that actually might have been the most clever thing that's ever done in a I would actually like to know what the Japanese line is to know if it was like written like oh that in Japanese God, or if so the translator was just really smart it. about it. Oh, I I love that. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. There's a concept called bullyism, which is named after a famous translator. For the audience members, essentially, it's the idea of a translator adding in their own material in the translation which helps improve the quality. So these might be jokes or like a pun that doesn't never existed in the original version, but they add it because it just could fit so well into the translated material. See, that's when localizers can be really good. That's the difference between just rote translation and localization. It's when yeah, I agree. When it works, it's just moi. Mm-hmm. Well, there's this um there's this article I read that was specifically about the uh the localization of um, Symphony of the Night, like you know the part yeah. where it's like, uh, "What is a man?" Wh- wh- you know, you know the part I'm talking about. I don't even have to say which one it is. You, yeah, it was like it was about that, and it was actually digging into. Okay, here's why that happened, and here's what the translator was thinking when he did that. It was really interesting. I'll try and find it again. Maybe put it in the show notes for you. Okay, so Jordan, do you have any last thoughts before we kind of really wrap things up? I mean, I just feel like um, it was meta for efficiency, and mm-hmm. in doing so, it just stripped out anything interesting. Mm-hmm. I-, I would agree. And then, ultimately, Jordan, would you consider Zipman two exclamation points? Very important. Yes. Would you consider it a flop or not? You know what? I'm sorry, Zipman. I think you're a flop. I'm going to have to agree. Now, for the actual final question, though, is how does this rank the Chainsaw Man? Oh, man. Dude, this is... Uh, definitely read Chainsaw Man over this. Oh, my God. Chainsaw Man is so much better than this. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, oh. it's, it's just better. Yeah. 
maybe not in the maybe not necessarily in the mechanical the mechanics of the art, but just everything else. <laughs> yeah. And then though, when it comes to Zipman, if you want to buy the book Action Shonen with some great art, Zipman isn't terrible. It isn't, you know, and it's a fast read. Honestly, even though I said it's a flop, I'm not saying you shouldn't read it. It I in as much as I'm talked shit about it, I enjoyed reading it. Oh, I just said that to make the terrible joke because it's a zipper. What? I'm gonna have to edit this out. That's okay. Okay. No. <laughs> I really was trying to make a really dumb zipper joke. I don't even. Okay. And thank you guys for listening. Uh, hopefully, you had as much fun as we did. Yeah. Look forward to our next podcast where we'll be covering another cancel manga. I think next week we're gonna do Bleach, right? Fuck you. We're not doing Bleach. <laughs> we're never gonna do Bleach. I refuse to do Bleach. This is David. This is Jordan. And you've been listening to Shonen Flop.